Try right, to pick it up with the capillaries down to one layer. Just a T out. One layer. TI. There's no TM. There's no TA. So what we have here is just an endothelium. And um, there's also a basement membrane. And endothelium. But the basement membrane. <clears throat> the other facts I have there, they're the smallest ones. They're the smallest in length and the smallest in diameter. That diameter can maybe fit one red blood cell at a time. That's how wide it is, barely wide enough. So that's why that last term, Rouleau, it refers to um, the red blood cells, the RBCs, um, they're stacking. They have an ability to stack and then file through capillary, single file. File through one at a time. So even though they're the smallest in diameter and the smallest in length, they exist in these dense capillary beds. And they actually provide the most um, room for blood to flow. They exist in dense beds, provide the most cross-sectional area for blood flow. So when blood flow gets to the capillaries, starting from aorta, it flows out through the elastic and muscular, then arterioles, and when it gets to the capillary beds, the blood flow slows way down. When you have a fixed volume that now has more room to flow, the volume slows down. Slower velocity of flow. And that's usually presented in units of centimeters per second. It's a speed, it's a velocity. Slows down, and this creates more time for exchanges to be made with the tissues, and that's the whole point of the vasculature. Uh, so yeah, we'll talk about that. Let's look at uh, this picture here. Here's a picture of skeletal muscle, but you can see um, Well, the blood cells flowing through one at a time. That's the, the rouleau. I say it up there, you just kind of file through like a stack of pancakes. Because RBCs are, are flat cells, they're not round. Now, some structural differences. I mean, not all capillaries are created equal. They all, they're all like, they got the TI thing, but they're leaky to various degrees. So they all have the one layer but there's these different kinds, depending on their function. The ones that um, allow the least amount of exchange are the continuous capillaries. the least leaky, I say not so leaky, because, um, well they do leak, but well, they're the least leaky because their endothelial cells form more or less a continuous layer. There's barely any gaps between the cells that make them leaky. 
endothelial cells, which I always abbreviate ECs, form a quote unquote continuous layer, hence continuous capillaries. Gas clefts between cells, between ECs, are small. So that limits the exchange. Um, you usually see these kinds of capillary beds in skin and muscle. For skin, skin's a barrier to the outside world. So you want to limit pathogens getting in when you cut your skin. For muscle, when you um, undergo strenuous exercise and you build up a lactic acid, you want to minimize the acidity of the blood. So you want to limit the uh, exchange. They have continuous capillaries there. Uh, the middle category is fenestrated. Fenestrated. Uh, a fenestration is a pore. These are porous. Fenestrated capillaries are leaky because, well, you have larger gaps and clefts between cells, between ECs. Also, um, the, the ECs themselves are whole, are porous. They have holes in them. Those are called fenestrations. I'll just say they're present. So larger molecules are allowed to exchange at these capillary beds. You see these in endocrine glands. Because hormones have to enter the bloodstream, you see them in the uh, intestinal capillaries. So that way the, the nutrients from the food can be absorbed. And also, um, glomerular capillaries of the kidney are fenestrated because they have to filter all the blood. So you need those cells to be porous. Or marry your capillaries. Those are in the kidney. Now the last category are the sinusoidal capillaries. I mean, they have the largest gaps and clefts. And even the basement membrane is not continuous, if you look at the picture. Largest gaps, clefts, um, pores, fenestrations, right? And um, you have a discontinuous basement membrane. The best example of where you find sinusoidal capillaries is the bone marrow. The bone marrow, that's where the blood cells are produced, so they have to enter the bloodstream. So this allows whole cells to enter the bloodstream. Bone marrow. There's a close-up view of a basement membrane, and you can see the, that the gaps are between cells. As you can even see, there's holes in the cell. They're fenestrated. And they even show an uh, endoexocytosis process happening uh, right here. So this just um, shows how the um, capillaries can be an exchange medium. And this slide is showing 
this, this show is it's completely covered on the inside with holes. This is the glomerular capillary and uh, shows how the ECs can be porous. Great picture. Here's a picture I took. And what it's showing is um, <coughs> one cell getting through. So that's the width, barely enough for one blood cell. That's how I, so okay, that's a capillary. And I only saw one layer, just the TI. This is from rat testes. All right, so that's some um, capillaries. I'm gonna come back to capillaries. I'm gonna talk more about the capillary exchange, but I just wanna kind of finish the idea of arteries, capillaries, and then veins. So the veins are presented here, right after the capillaries. We're down to one layer. We start rebuilding the layers. The venules are capillary-like. They have two layers. spindle-shaped cell, what would you call it? A smooth muscle cell. And those were in the TA. So when you get to the venules, the, their job is to collect the blood that has exchanged at the capillaries. And, uh, they're like, they're capillary-like. So, so you're back to two layers. TI, a bit of a TM, but you collect blood from capillary beds. We'll see an example of uh, the venule in the liver. Okay. Let's go back up and build all three layers. Uh, veins are, are considered large or small. They, they give you an average diameter of about five millimeters. That, that's pretty good. But we're back to three meaning all three, TI, TM, TA, are all present. And we talked about features of veins before, but what we had noted earlier before the break is that the TA is most pronounced in large veins. Prominent TA. Okay, so you go arteries, capillaries, veins, back to the heart. Here's a picture of a vein, that um, hole in the middle. I call it the shower drain. It reminds me of it. It's basically liver lobule. And that hole in the middle is a good example of a vein, of a venule. And um, what happens in liver physiology is it receives all the blood from basically everything in your ab cavity, everything from your intestines. After you eat, all that nutritious blood is sent to the liver, and it all drains toward the middle. Okay, and once it gets to the shower drain, the venule, it's on the way out. But along the way, as it trickles towards the middle, the hepatocytes have a chance to process the food you ate because the portal blood that flows to the liver contains all the nutrients. But anyways, that, that's a good example of venule. There's a large vein, okay? They're typically larger than the arteries that they run with. We looked at that picture before. If I could point out the tunics, take a look at that. Unlabeled, I mean, what would you call this pink layer from here to here? T M. There's T A. The, col uh, the collagenous appearance there, and uh, I even see a little I E L right there of the T I. I have it labeled on the next slide. I point to the T I. T M in a large T A for a large vein. Okay, so I said I wanted to switch back to capillary physiology. And so I wanted to define a few things. Um, so this takes a little more explanation, unpacking. That's why I wanted to kind of like come back to it. The capillary exchange, you must understand fluid compartments and pressures. When you have capillary exchange and systemic capillaries, 
The fluid compartment inside the blood vessels is a compartment. The fluid outside the blood vessels is a compartment. The fluid inside the cells is a compartment. So you're exchanging pretty much between uh, inside and outside the capillary. The pressures, understand hydrostatic and colloid osmotic pressure. The hydrostatic pressure We call it that, it's simply, whenever I refer to blood pressure, I'm referring to this pressure. This is the pressure that makes blood flow. Okay, it's as simple as that. You turn on the garden hose, the, the water pressure inside the garden hose makes the water come out, that's the same kind of pressure. This pressure, it forces fluids out of capillaries. word is we say filtration it's, it's filtered out of those leaky capillaries and well the blood pressure at capillaries it drops it's not 93 it's it's about 35 around there when it gets to the capillaries millimeters of mercury just to put a number to it there's a pressure that opposes it that's the blood colloid osmotic pressure Blood colloid osmotic pressure. <coughs> that that pressure, um, what it opposes the hydrostatic pressure. It draws fluids into the capillary. We call that absorption. So you have filtration, absorption. And those are the two things I like to present. They're, they're, I mean, I list them here, but that, that's um, part of what I want you to think about. The other thing I want you to think about is diffusion. That's also happening in capillary exchange. Where molecules flow from an area of high to low concentration. Things like O2 or nutrients like glucose or anything. High to low. This is all part of the capillary exchange discussion. And um, this is the picture I usually teach from. It, it kind of shows students that a single capillary has two ends. The end that's connected to the arteries and the end that's connected to the veins. Okay. And so, <coughs> let's kind of write that on the board. There's an arterial end, well on this, well, it's the red end, it's the one on the left. At some point there's a midsection where the, where the pressure forces cancel each other out. So let's call that capillary midsection. And then there's the venous end. Now the venous end, well, okay, I'll get to it. Let's, um, so what are you supposed to look at? Let's talk about the fluid exchange first. Let's look at where they, where they call it P-cap. That's the hydrostatic pressure, the P-cap, the regular blood pressure. It drops to about 32 by the time you get to the arterial end of a capillary. That's this 32 millimeters of mercury. It's a little higher. It changes. Now the millimeters of mercury um, that's greater than the hydrostatic pressure, which they symbolize, the hydrostatic pressure, 32, is greater than the osmotic pressure, which is, they symbolize with the, uh, the symbol pi. So let me make sure you understand that. This is hydrostatic, and this is osmotic. Think of osmosis. 
blood goes, um, I said blood goes, stuff goes, you know, um, water flows this way and that way. I always tell my students, water will always flow to where the most stuff is. So in osmotic pressure, if there's a lot of uh, sodium and uh, bl red blood cells, other things that draw fluids into you, that's a, like a sucking pressure. This pressure is pushing things out, but this is drawing fluids into you. Like if you have hypertension, the doctor will recommend a low sodium diet because you want less sodium in your bloodstream so you don't feel bloated and you don't retain uh, fluid because you're already hypertense. You already have hypertension. So that pressure, put a number to it, is like, they put a negative 25. 25, but negative because it opposes the hydrostatic pressure. So what we have is a net filtration. But notice that the hydrostatic pressure drops because you're losing fluid. And by the time you get to the midsection, by definition, the hydrostatic pressure is 25. And it's the same as the osmotic pressure, which is negative 25. So there's no net filtration or absorption. There's no net fluids in or out. And, and lastly, at the venous end, you have some absorption, where the hydrostatic pressure is less than the osmotic pressure. Net absorption. So that's essentially what I wanted you to get for the fluid exchange. They do show that to you. Net filtration, that's the clear arrows going out there. And then you have a net absorption at the venous end. Notice there's more filtration than absorption. There's actually a net flow out of two liters a day. So that's where the lymphatics comes in. Um, the picture from your book shows the capillary fluid exchange in this way. I just kind of labeled it. They put the out arrow, the black arrows as uh, net filtration, or the hydrostatic pressure is greater. No net fluid exchange there, and basically reabsorption. So they show the reverse arrows of fluids being picked up, and they even show a, a lymphatic uh, capillary to pick up the excess fluid. The only thing you should add to your notes is the metabolite exchange. At the arterial end, you tend to have O2 and nutrients diffuse out. <laughs> and then, at the venous end, CO2 and waste products, nitrogenous waste products, will diffuse in. Diffuse in. CO2 and waste. This figure reminds you of that uh, other fact I mentioned. Because uh, blood flow slows down when you have more area to flow in, that's what you see, the capillaries. The blood flow is the slowest because you have the most cross-sectional area. Uh, yeah, it's kind of like uh, if you ever go on white water rafting and the part where you get to the white expanse, everything slows down. There's normal turbulent blood flow and uh, everything's smooth sailing. All right, so that's capillary pressure. But um, that kind of concludes the part where I teach about the tunics and the structure of blood vessels. And I want to teach about uh, physiology of blood pressure. <clears throat> and so these, these are, um, this is as simple as I can make it in terms of how the book usually lays it out for students. You always talk about the flow of fluids.
pressure and then resistance to blood flow. Okay, so that's kind of my outline. When we talked about the heart, inflow and outflow refer to the cardiac cycle. And you're filling the ventricles, and then you have the pumping of blood out of the ventricles. So the ventricles was the centerpiece. But in the blood vessels chapter, we usually focus on the systemic arteries. So I'm going to use this picture to teach from. Note to yourself that of all the blood vessels we've talked about this morning, focus on systemic <coughs> arteries, not pulmonary, systemic. So I'm writing systemic arterial pressure. The pressure you measure inside you know, your patients, this is the pressure. It's one of the vital signs. And it's controlled by the inflow and outflow of blood into or out of the arteries. So since we just took a, had a chapter on heart, the inflow is the cardiac output. Okay. But, um, so let's remember what I have on the slide there. We're talking about arteries here, so let's remember these are um, vessels with a small capacitance. So therefore, arterial pressure is controlled by, you control the inflow and outflow. You can't, what you can't control is how much they hold. You know, they're always full because their capacitance is small. So if you want to control blood pressure, you have to either increase this or decrease this or increase that or decrease that. So that's kind of like as simple as we can put it. I already talked about CVP, but they have it on this figure here. It's different for arteries as it is for veins. That's why they draw the veins much bigger. These are small capacitance. These are large capacitance. Um, at the time, say you're, you're a nurse, you're monitoring your four patients or however many they give you. At the time you measure BP, you're estimating the volume of blood in the arteries. You're estimating blood volume that time, period. So you have to keep measuring it and remeasuring it, make sure your patient's okay. And if pressure changes, what you what you say is, well say for example, pressure drops, you assume the blood flow, the blood volume is dropping. And so now we want students to think about, well how do you control it? Well, I mean, it's either one thing or the other. The arterioles are either letting blood out or the heart's not pumping enough blood to get it in if the blood pressure is dropping. Um, that's kind of why we talk about this. So blood flow for the arteries is determined by the cardiac output. given by different equations usually taught in physics class. But for us, we'll just say blood flow past the aortic valve, the aortic SL valve. Because flow, you have to study flow past the fixed point. 
So in the anatomy, I'll just say the aortic valve is, is good enough. Because that flow, that's your inflow. Flow F is determined by CO, our cardiac output, which is usually uh, five liters per minute. Flow past a fixed point, the aortic valve. And so blood flow is determined by that. And that's it. <clears throat> your heart rate, your stroke volume. We studied um, how that can be modified to modify the cardiac output. That determines the blood flow into the arteries. Okay. And the outflow, uh, I'll get to it, but I want to talk about blood pressure first. So if you have adequate cardiac output, you're going to have adequate blood pressure. Now there are different ways you can talk about blood pressure. There are three typical pressures that are taught. Okay. We're just thinking about blood pressure in terms of the blood exerting a force on the vessel wall. So step one, blood is flowing. Great. Step two, can you measure a pressure in your patient's arteries? Oh, okay, well, I mean, here's kind of like um, the, the free body diagram that's given to show the students different pressures. Uh, any pressure, it's kind of a pressure difference between two locations. That's what I want you to think about when you talk about blood pressure. A pressure difference. Another way to put it, a pressure gradient. So when you um, isolate a blood vessel like that in three-dimensional space, you can consider the hydrostatic pressure, the transmural pressure, and the driving pressure. The hydrostatic pressure Okay, that's simply the pressure against gravity. Because usually when you stand upright, you have to consider that. For example, if your head is above your heart when you sit up or stand up, the heart has to pump blood up to your head, right? It has to overcome that. That's all I'll say about it. It's the pressure against gravity. The transmural pressure I'll point to the picture here. It's the pressure across the vessel wall. So if you can kind of like cut, cut that it's the, directly the pressure on the inside versus the outside. So if you're kind of like um, looking at a blood vessel here, cross-sectional view, I mean literally the blood inside is pushing against the vessel walls, but if you could measure the pressure directly on the inside versus directly on the outside, that's what we're talking about here. This pressure is more important to us in this class because we talk about it in terms of your body being able to detect changes in this. Your body can detect transmural pressure. If your blood pressure changes, the body wants to re-regulate it. So if you have a nerve, <clears throat> you know, a branch of cranial nerve 9, Here's the cell body. They have one extension that will go into the vessel wall. It acts as a sensor. So if there's changes in pressure, if pressure drops, this little nerve ending can pick it up. Transmural means across the wall. So uh, that's real important. We'll talk about transmural pressure when we talk about the baroreceptor reflex more. 
The last pressure shown here inside the central axis of the tube, this delta X, that, we call that the driving pressure. And that's the pressure that pushes blood forward. It's, it's the most important one. It's the pressure difference along the central axis of the blood vessel. Along central axis. So imagine you have a, a large blood vessel, there's two that represents a blood vessel and that central axis all the way through. You have two points in the tube, say X1. X2. If blood is going to flow from point 0.1 to point 0.2, the pressure at X, say 90, better be higher than X2, say 40. Okay, so um, that's kind of what I have on this slide here. Flow between two points. It's a change in pressure. It's a pressure gradient. It's, it's, not, it's not the absolute pressure. So what's important is pressure gradient, a differential. not absolute pressure. The fact that there's pressure doesn't matter. Where you're flowing to, it has to be lower. That's the point. I mean, if pressure is the same in both locations, change that second point to 90, 90, 90. Well, there's pressure, but there's no flow. Um, that's kind of what we understand. So this driving pressure is the pressure that's making your blood flow. So when you measure blood pressure in your patient, um, or in yourself, or in anybody, you're measuring one location. You usually do it at the brachial artery, so okay, that's normal, then what you say is, that's enough pressure to push blood to the capillaries. Okay, that's all we're saying when you measure someone's blood pressure. So, um, like in a simple textbook um, illustration here, look at the numbers I put. And you know, in your head, go ahead and look at that and answer the question as I erase the board. So what do you think? A is correct because it has a steeper gradient, 80 versus 25. And the structure that's providing the pressure for us is the left ventricle. Okay, I kind of asked and answered my own question. Which cardiovascular structure generates this pressure gradient? It's the pressure generated by um, the left ventricle. So great, now you've, you've talked about cardiac output, you can measure blood pressure, but um, the other thing is think about the blood outflow, blood getting out of the arteries, into the capillaries. You need a certain amount of peripheral resistance to keep blood in the arteries. Blood's pumping here, but let's kind of like keep it in the arteries so we can have enough pressure to push blood to where we need it to go. So we call this the peripheral resistance or the outflow. Anything that is the, the resistance to blood flowing out. That's what I'm trying to define here. Peripheral resistance. That's kind of the physiology catchphrase. Peripheral resistance. Sometimes abbreviated PR. I usually just abbreviated capital R. Anything that opposes blood flowing. Anything. We call that the outflow. Anything that opposes blood flow. 
So, um, well, the number one thing is the friction of blood rubbing against the vessel wall. Friction. How oh, was that? Something. There's other parameters typically listed in blood vessel chapters in books, and I list them here. Um, go over here. Viscosity of blood. Now, in adults, it doesn't usually change. It's pretty constant. But if it were to change, the rule is if you increase the, the goopiness of blood, you increase the resistance to blood flow. But it's, it's usually a constant. So I usually don't mention it very much because it doesn't alter very much. So I'll just say a constant. Then there's vessel length. So the general rule is, if you increase the length of a vessel, well, you're increasing the resistance simply because a longer vessel has more friction because it's longer, so it has a longer way to travel. That's it. But in adults, this is a constant because you stop growing and the vessel length in your body generally doesn't change. And then we list um, turbulent blood flow. If you increase turbulent flow, turbulence is an increase in resistance to blood flow. Basically, it's not a good thing. The opposite of turbulent is laminar. So I'll put that parentheses. That's the opposite. And the laminar is kind of the good blood flow. So it's like if you have laminar flow, imagine these smooth, like aerodynamic lines of flow, nice and undisturbed. Think of blood flowing in layers within a blood vessel. It's nice and smooth. But things happen in the anatomy where if you branch, that fork in the road, it disrupts the laminar blood flow. And it creates all these little eddies and swirls, and that increases some resistance to blood flow that we must overcome. Well, the other thing is if you present um, some kind of plaque inside the vessel wall, like an atherosclerosis, and uh, that, that will disrupt your nice, smooth laminar flow. You have to flow around that, it creates all kinds of uh, resistance to blood flow. So plaques or um, branching of blood vessels, that does increase resistance to blood flow. Usually what we focus on the most is the vessel radius. capital R, but lowercase r, remember that in geometry? That's what we're talking about. Okay. If you, you can alter that because of the tunica media, because of the sympathetic tone, you can kind of clamp down. So for example, if you look at a cross-sectional view, clamp down right there. What you're doing is you're decreasing little r, increasing big r by a lot. In fact, look it up in your book. Overall peripheral resistance is inversely related to radius to the fourth power. That's usually what you'll see. Uh, simply put, you affect radius a little, you increase resistance a lot. Okay. And this helps, um, well this event is called vasoconstriction. It's usually due to a sympathetic response. You know, that's like you're scared, you're panicked, you're fighting for your life, something like that. Uh, very dangerous. And uh, well, what you're doing is you're clamping down. You're kind of like cutting off blood flow there. But you're going to keep 
more blood in the systemic arteries and you're going to divert it to working muscles to help you run or fight or whatever the situation is, right? It's your sympathetic response. Uh, so the effect of a sympathetic response is you decrease little r, increase big r overall, the net effect, you're, you're going to see a jump in blood pressure. And we're going to do a lab Friday and um, we do this. One of the ways you can initiate sympathetic response is pain. A safe, painful stimulus that we do is called the cold pressure test, where the subject will submerge their hand in slushy ice water. It's very painful. What that does is it kind of gets the blood pressure up. And um, over a, a time course of three minutes, your lab mates will measure your blood pressure in the other arm. Okay, Because it's a systemic response. Students think, oh, wait, don't you have to do it in the same arm? And if you're, no, it's all over, right? Just do the other arm. Okay. So one hand submerged, the other hand blood pressure cuts every minute. Take a reading, very painful. Uh, so we call it noxious stimuli. It's kind of fun if it's not you. But for the person that's brave enough to do it, you're free to tap out. If you can't handle it, your group will be excused from that activity. I'm not gonna force anyone to endure the full three minutes. Although students are always trying to do it. <laughs> it's very rare I get students that can't do all three minutes. I'm just throwing that out there. Usually you can do it. Now, I don't wanna see anyone pass out. Like for example, one semester I had a student, she lost all the color in her face. What? You gotta look out for that. It can happen. This is very painful. So I'm just warning you. That, that's Friday's lab. Uh, look forward to that. It's standard. I didn't make it up. Yeah. I'm getting ways to torture you. Uh, I want to stop here. You guys have online tests to worry about. I do have your essays. If you'd like to see them, stick around.